So um, without further ado, please put your hands together for Jonathan Morgan. Thank you so much. Um, it is, um, it's so good to be with you guys. Thank you for coming out. I'm just having the most amazing time, I'm truly. I'm just gonna stand here like this. Oh yeah, let's do that. <laughs> kind of put your head on, on my chest here like John the Beloved, that would be great. <laughs> just stay right there. It's very comforting for me, actually. Um, You're welcome. <laughs> No, this is really, this has been a great trip so far, and I did love doing the podcast. There was a lot of, um, a lot of inside baseball with that today in terms of um, old CCM culture. So I don't know if anybody, I know the kids today are wild about their Carmen. We'll see if, if anyone understands any joke from today. I don't know. Um, but we had a good time. And, and this trip in general has been, has been amazing. So uh, Ferg just, just hooked me up right. I got in Saturday in time to see U2 Saturday night end of the tour in Dublin, so that was extraordinary. And he's promised that every day would be even better. So we're just building as we go. And, um, but yeah, it, it really is great to be here. Um, it's funny, I was just thinking to myself, I think I'm, um, my, my background, I call myself a hillbilly Pentecostal. I grew up in these very um, conservative Pentecostal churches, this kind of camp meeting revival culture. So I will say, I've never felt more naughty than I do right now. <laughs> Here we are talking about Jesus, and I've got a microphone in one hand and a beer in the other. This has never happened before. My father would be horrified. Please don't tell him. He's still a Church of God preacher. Wonderful man. Um, but yeah, I wanted, to, I wanted to share some with you tonight. Um, uh, as Greg mentioned, I do have a book coming out called How to Survive a Shipwreck, and uh, that's, I, I recently finished that, and um, it, it's a book that's really come out of a lot of pain, personally, in my life, and um, a work that's uniquely vulnerable, but at the same time feels, feels really important, and um, this is really one of the first opportunities I've had to kind of talk about the book in the setting, because uh, up until this point, a lot of it's just been the creative work of actually, of actually doing it, but um, yeah, th this, this last leg of my life has been, has been a really complex one, but really important, too. I was thinking about this yesterday, sharing with, with Ferg and some of my new friends in, in the community there. Um, I feel like my greatest fear historically in life really has been of humiliation of any sort. Like I just, I can handle anything better than being embarrassed. Um, my worst, you, you know that dream that you have of going to middle school in your underwear, like that kind of thing. Like that is my worst fear. So as it turns out, I feel like part of the grace of the last couple of years is getting much more comfortable with humiliation and need. Um, and th this is a little bit silly, but it's funny how much this kind of summed up this season of my life in some ways. October of last year, I, I was uh, coming out of some things we'll share more about in a few minutes. And I had this sense of, man, um, God's doing some really wonderful things in my life. Feels like things are getting back on track. This is going to be great. And I had a trip booked to Sweden uh, to speak. And it was like a series of seminaries, uh, churches, that kind of thing. And I was so excited. Uh, I'd always wanted to go to Sweden. Um, uh, actually, for any film buffs, I'm a big fan of Ingmar Bergman movies. Anybody else know Bergman? Um, great movies to watch if you're depressed, for sure. That will just, uh, I'm joking about that. They will push you over the edge. If you're depressed, do not watch them. You will jump off a tall building. Um, but I do love, they're, they're dark, uh, but they're always these really wonderful theological themes, and I love Bergman. And so it turns out that uh, the same week I was going to speak in Sweden, there was this Ingmar Bergman film festival on Faro, this little island where he did, did most of his major work. So I was so excited about that. And I don't know, I just had this whole sense that this is my reboot. This is the new season begins. And I could almost hear Tom Petty's free falling like in my head. It was kind of like, this is going to be my great new adventure. So I, I, I got into uh, Stockholm, flew to this little town of uh, Visby, which is, you know, basically been around since 1100. So very small roads and all this. I, I should say this, I'd barely slept on the plane. I don't sleep on planes, so I was kind of sleep deprived. I just got my rental car. And keep in mind, again, my fear of embarrassment. And especially when I'm traveling el elsewhere, because I think there's something about not only being an American, but being a very large American that like, I'm just so afraid of making a fool of myself and being that guy, you know, that this, I don't want to be the stupid American, you know, so I'm not good at blending in at my size, but I try. And uh, I, I, had, I had rented this little Volkswagen and it was a stick shift, kind of, which I hadn't driven in a couple years and it was a little bit different there. So anyway, I'm driving through Visby, through this little town and it's very quaint and all that. Lot, but it's all like these kind of small one lane streets. And I was going down uh, this street, basically like an alley between these two buildings, 
where all of a sudden I had this sensation that it felt like the walls were closing in on me. And I thought it was just because I was sleep deprived. I'm like, this is some kind of an optical illusion. Finally, I realized, no, no, like it's actually getting more narrow as I go. And by the end, um, you could barely like get a bicycle through there. I mean, these, you know, these streets were just not built with cars in mind. So I realized this. And at that point, I had not yet had to put the car in reverse. So I tried going, going downhill, tried to put the car in reverse, and I just rolled further down the hill. Could not get in reverse. Tried to, the next time, three times, four times, every time I would just inch further down the hill until finally I was literally wedged between the walls. Like when I say wedged, I don't just mean like you couldn't open the door. That was true. But I mean, I was like wedged, like tight sandwiched in and I'm just sitting there in this alley like the, the there's no sunroof like the only way I could get out would be if I broke through the windshield <laughs> or the back and I didn't have like a, a cell phone plan that worked I was going to pick up a little you know like cheap phone while I was here so I, I was just freaking out and I'm this very large man in this really small car and <laughs> finally like uh, at, at, at the bottom of the hill there was a pub on the corner and some people came out and I thought, oh, maybe they'll help me. But I like, I like, do I wave? Like, what do I do? And they, they come around the corner, they look at me, and so help me, they started taking pictures of me <laughs> with their cell phones. Like a, a group of three or four of them, like, you've got it, like, they're really taking pictures. They went back to the pub, got more of their friends, who also took pictures. Not making this up. I promise you, somewhere between 30 and 40 people eventually took pictures of me in that car because it was such a spectacle <laughs> finally this like really sweet older man came out who made conversation and he uh he volunteered to call like a tow truck which i was so grateful for but it still took another hour and 20 minutes for the tow truck out there with me just sitting just before the tow truck got there you can't make this up a guy comes who has like this really long camera like a professional camera and he was taking pictures too <laughs> So tow truck gets there, they put like the line on the back of the car and they reel me out while this whole crowd of people is watching. Still laughing, by the way, watching me getting re <laughs> pulled back up the alley and I'm just kind of sitting there. <laughs> it was really, it was so awkward. But they, they, they get me up and the guy with the camera comes and asks me some questions. It turns out he's, he was from the local paper. And um, true story, that picture of me was on the front page of the local paper the next morning. And the headline, translated from Swedish, was, Oh no, not again, another American stuck in an alley. Apparently that happens two or three times a year. So, with my dread fear of, of humiliation, front page of the paper. And that was within my first two hours on the ground that this happened. It just seemed like, man, it was funny too, because people, I'm riffing a little bit right now, but people in Sweden are so sweet. But I tell you, in that moment, as people were taking pictures of stuff, I, I couldn't believe how much I hated the country of Sweden. I mean, it was irrational. I decided I was going to sell my Volvo when I got home. I'm going to boycott Ikea. I'll never eat another Swedish meatball. I even hated the freaking Swedish chef. I was so, I was so mad. And then like, and just all this, I, and I loved Sweden before that, but all of a sudden it's like I hated them. I hated them for their wonderful health care and all that. But once the guy like helped me out, it just completely changed. I fell in love again with Sweden and their streamlined design and Scandinavian comfort and universal health care. I'm like, this is great. But anyway, I'm, I'm being silly. But it was, it, it was interesting how much that for me felt like such a metaphor for what this whole season of my life has been is kind of being the guy stuck in the car totally helpless and dependent on someone else to reel me out. And that's just not a place I've ever been. I feel like most of my life I've been strong and competent and things came fairly easy. Um, I, I, I mentioned before my dad's a preacher, my grandfather was a preacher, so grew up in this very um, religious environment, came to faith at an early age, and that's all I've known, you know. I, I really don't remember a time when I wasn't following Jesus in, in some capacity. Never really even had a um, uh, kind of a prodigal season in my life. I was too afraid of hell and the rapture. <laughs> They showed those 70s rapture movies when I was a kid, and I did, a lot of therapy has helped me with that in more recent years. But I was too scared to do anything fun, and um, just so much of my life was very kind of on the straight and narrow. Went to college, felt called to ministry, went to seminary, then did a degree, did another seminary degree. In the midst of all that, you know, did several years of youth ministry, planted a church in Charlotte, where I'm from, Charlotte, North Carolina, and that, that I really loved, and all of my life just kind of seemed to be a kind of upwardly mobile path, uh, until a couple years ago, when, it, when really a number of things uh, began to, to fall off the rails. A lot of this is in the book, but I guess in short, um, 
And I still feel like I'm learning how to talk about this because it's all still fresh enough to where, uh, truthfully, there's a lot of pain there. But uh, my marriage began to disintegrate. Um, my wife and I had, had issues for a number of years. I think the spotlight and pressure of doing ministry from um, really all of our marriage had, I think that pressure was really intense. Um, I had a season and all that where I'd become emotionally entangled with someone else. Um, and that, uh, of course, complicated things horribly. We ended up taking some time away from ministry to kind of sort all that out, hoping to kind of make, make it all better, which in many ways turned out to uh, things between us just kind of spiraled more out of control. So um, after taking this sabbatical, I went back to the church that I founded, really in almost worse shape, but with this sense that this is this thing that God's given me to do, and I have to do this, we need to do this, and once again kind of pull it together. Um, long story short, really within the few months after that, um, I would say now I think I came really close to having a nervous breakdown. I think the stress of where I was and all the things that weren't sorted and trying to do all of that in the context of pastoral ministry was, um, w was just too much. And so I kind of went from this life where, again, everything had been very neat and linear and uh, straight and narrow to really having the sense of, of things falling completely apart. And this is, it has been a very painful season walking through all of that, walking through um, kind of final stages of divorce. It's been, it's been unbelievably messy. Uh, but I think a lot of what this book has come out of for me has been, um, and what's been remarkable about it, is that in, in this season where I felt like I was kind of losing my life as I knew it, um, in so many ways it feels like, I don't know, I've, I've been a professional Christian for so long, um, since I was 21 years old, and I'm 37. And in, like, in some ways, I feel like in these last couple of years, it feels like the first time I've really been a Christian, which sounds terrible to say, but I think like um, all the ways that when you become that desperately dependent and you don't have anything to rely on anymore, it just creates an environment where, you know, there's great need for God and therefore encounter with God. And I think all these ways that... In fact, so many of the most remarkable things I think that God has done in my life, strange enough, have been on the other side of this, of this process. But uh, again, it's been marked by a tremendous amount of pain. So I wanted to write honestly about that and really just coming first person from these things that I've learned about what it's like to survive shipwreck, how it is to uh, encounter God uh, when you're... When, I feel like in a lot of ways you don't even know you have a soul until it's almost like you, you, you feel it bleed. And that's what this, this season has been like for me. But, but just finding God in that in such a such a profound way. I wanted to, um, I didn't want to do a big reading because I think the jury's still out for me as to whether or not that's ever a great way to communicate, you know. Um, I, I don't want to, to feel like, I don't know, the reading rainbow or something. Did y'all have the reading rainbow in Ireland? Did that make it over here? Um, no, okay, not so much, okay. Uh, great, thank you for your honesty. In the future of things, just nod and go along. <laughs> sort of like, Again, I'm terribly afraid of being embarrassed, but now you already know my stuff. Um, but this is, this is a, a, just an excerpt I want to read out of the first chapter uh, called The Waters That Drown or The Waters That Save, that, that for me just really sum up a lot of what this, this time has looked like for me. So I'll just read that and we'll, we'll talk a bit more. Billions of years ago, before there was a human, there was a sea. There was a watery, shapeless chaos, a blackness that had no form and no meaning. Spirit came and hovered over the black liquid night of the waters. The dove brooded over the anarchy that we call the sea. And she stayed there long enough, breathed into her deep enough, for life to come shimmering up out of the ocean. It is these primordial waters that we come from, the same water that poured out of the woman you called mother in the hours before you were born. It is into these dark waters that you must return, into this primitive abyss, into this watery grave. You must return again to the chaos of the world you knew before you start trying to build a world you can, the, the world you knew before you started trying to build a world you could control. Back to the bottom of the ocean where you once lay submerged. In secular terms, we call this phenomenon drowning. In the Christian tradition, we have a different name for it, baptism. The bad news is that this shipwreck feels like death because you really may be dying. The bad news is that old and familiar things that you loved and that made you what you were are slowly passing away. The good news is that you're being born and that this drowning that makes possible the moment when all things become new, most, I'm sorry, I'm butchering this right now. The good news is that you're being born and that this drowning makes possible the moment when all things become new, most of all yourself. 
Maybe a preacher on the radio told you once that you must be born again if you repeated a prayer after him. How I wish this were so. But in the scripture, when a man named Nicodemus comes under the cloak of night for a secret rendezvous with Jesus, and the prophet speaks to him about being born again, is also where Jesus talks about that spirit, the one who broods over the sea, bringing life and beauty out of chaos. The spirit is like the wind, he says. You don't know where it comes from, and you don't know where it is going. And the people who say yes to this undomesticated spirit, the people who say yes to the wind, yes to the sea, will be like this spirit, not knowing where they came from or where they are going. They are people who learn to trust the wind instead of fighting it, people who learn to navigate the chaos rather than eliminate it. They will be people born of spirit, people born of the violence of the storm and the wildness of the wind. And because the spirit that enters them is the spirit of life itself, they will live forever. You can't descend back into the waters of your mother's womb, the prophet tells Nicodemus, but you can be born again, you can be made new. It's just that when you do, it won't be because you made, quote, a decision for Jesus, because you prayed the magic prayer. If you wish to become someone and something else entirely than the you that you were before the storm came, you will have to peer into the sea that threatens to swallow you whole, dive into the mouth of it, and trust. You will have to let God happen to you, which, which requires letting life happen to you all the way down. You cannot continue to flail your arms, beat against the sea, and damn the waves. You have to let yourself go all the way under, into the depths of God, into the depths of your own soul, into the depths of life itself. You will have to linger at the ocean floor where the sea monsters live and confront everything in you that you've constructed a whole life out of avoiding. You will have to confront the mysteries that lie on the bottom of you. Just in case you are in fact drowning and don't feel like you can quite hold out for another 100 pages or more, I'll give you one spoiler. Love is the mystery at the bottom of all the others. To almost everyone's surprise, until an invisible hand holds them underwater long enough, the most beautiful things in all of creation are down here, below, beneath, under the world that you knew. These very waters that are drowning you now have the life-giving power of spirit within them, deep beneath the current. The waters that drag you down where you do not wish to go, if you don't resist them, will spit you out like Jonah, spewed out of the belly of the whale. And you will burst out of the waters the second time, just like you did in the first. Screaming in terror, shimmering in your sea-soaked, reddish new skin, glad to be out, terrified to be here, but damn here anyway, and so wonderfully alive, breathing, terribly hopeful, no longer encumbered by unnecessary things like clothes, ideas, or expectations of what the world should be. The waters that drown you are the same waters that will save you, and the same sea that is killing you is the sea that will make you new. The things you've been holding on to cannot keep you afloat any longer. There is no going back down the birth canal where the spirit of life is pushing you forward despite yourself. The only way to lose yourself forever is to keep hanging on to the life you had before. The storm rides you hard, but the spirit whispers into the pitch black that surrounds you, carrying the words Jesus spoke to Nicodemus in the wind. You must be born again. So that's a bit of an excerpt from this book. Really a comedy, <laughs> truly. Uh, it's a, I just realized that, especially doing that for a reading. It's like, I start off with funny stories and, oh, <laughs> that's, that's very sad, preacher. Um, but, you know, I, I, that idea that the waters that, uh, that drown you are the waters that save you has, has really been profound for me because I do feel like in some ways it's precisely these things that I dreaded the most of uh, having my ego stripped away, of uh, enduring humiliation, um, that I feel like in so many ways is saving my life now. I think so much of what we do in what Richard Rohr refers to as the first half of life really is about constructing ego. It's a lot of image management. And I don't think there's any way that we really get out of that project without having something happen that devastates the ego. And that's, you know, this has very much been that for me. And, and I think it's different for everybody else. There are, any and all, there are many kinds of shipwrecks uh, that can come through the form of an unexpected illness, that can come through the uh, form of the resolution, uh, uh, of this significant relationship dissolving in some form. Uh, it can come through losing a job. There's so many ways that we can be shipwrecked. But I think always, these very things that would seem to threaten to just swallow us up really have the capacity to transform us if, if we let it happen. I know for me, um, a lot of what this process has been has involved really trying to figure out exactly what to do with... I, I realize now how much in my old life that I was clinging on to in ways that were really unhealthy, things that were really even good things but I, that I held to in an unhealthy way. 
And I feel like I've, I, I've been navigating this tension throughout this whole season of trying to figure out what it means to, on one hand, when you have a shipwreck and therefore, if the ship is your life, if the ship is the life that you've built board by board for yourself, right? And this is kind of the structure that carries you along. On the one hand, you know, you can't, um, you, you do need something to hold on to. If the ship falls apart, yeah, you, you've got to find something that you can hold on to long enough to stay afloat. Um, I refer a lot in the book to the story in Acts 27 of Paul's shipwreck, where you know he basically he gets this warning that the ship is going to go down, uh, but he he tells everybody on board that they're not going to lose their lives. They're, they won't lose their lives, but they will lose the ship. And um, there's this moment that I find especially interesting, and it's been such a visual for me, where basically everybody grabs a plank of the ship to hold on to get to the shore. And that for me has become just such a powerful metaphor, this idea that like, okay, the ship that holds you, that held you up before will not hold you any longer in the shipwreck, right? That's going down. But you have to have something to hold on to, something to cling on to, one small thing, um, one very simple thing, you know, finding whatever it is that will keep you afloat through the night, uh, what it is that will kind of get you to the shore, not figuring it all out and understanding, just something to hang on to. And yet, what makes it tricky is that I think so much of what happens in a shipwreck is that really you're having to let go of so much at the same time. I brought this up with the guys yesterday. When, um, so when in the kind of churches where I grew up in, again, we would have these really long altar services. It was really intense. And there was a lot of emphasis on speaking in tongues. You know, this idea that, you know, you don't really have the Holy Spirit until you speak in tongues. And I used to go down to every altar invitation wanted to speak in tongues and, and when I was a teenager, and that experience was elusive for me. I feel like everybody else had these crazy awesome things happening except for me. I always felt like I was the odd man out. And uh, I just remember this time in particular, this really happened to me, where being in one of those high octane Pentecostal worship services, I'm down there seeking the Holy Spirit. And I remember an old man in the church, really sweet old man, who's he's, you know, encouraging me. And he's in one ear and he's, really, he's literally shouting in my ear, hold on, brother, you just gotta hold on. Just hold on, hold on, hold on. I'm thinking to myself, that's what I, oh, yes, I'm going to hold on. I'm going to hold on. I'm going to hold on until I speak in tongues. And on the other hand, there was this really dear, sweet sister in the church who was in my other ear saying, brother, you just got to let go. <laughs> let go, let go, let go. And it was back and forth between the two of them. Hold on, brother. Let go, brother. And like really trying to figure out, okay, how do I simultaneously hold on and let go at the same time? Like that, now that is some Yoda business right there, right? <laughs> I feel like in many ways, that's, that is exactly what shipwreck looks like. You're trying to figure out how to hold on and let go all at once. What can you cling on to that you need to keep you afloat that's necessary? But then again, what other things is it only good and right that you have to let go of? What are, what are the expectations? What are the dreams that you had for your life before that you really have to let go of to be able to survive? Because I think the universal experience I've found from talking to so many other people in all kinds of shipwrecks is that the one thing that is guaranteed to just destroy you through that kind of season is if you keep clinging on too tightly to things that you really can't hold on to anymore. And I think that was a lot of what was happening for me when I kind of stubbornly um, tried to stay at the church when I knew I wasn't in a place emotionally, spiritually, where I was healthy enough to do it. It just didn't make sense, but I wanted it to so bad. So anyway, there, there, there's a lot I could say about that. But this business of, of learning how to simultaneously hold on and let go, um, finding that small thing that kind of keeps you afloat. Uh, in, that, in that season of my life, um, through all of that, and again, not like this is the distant past way back when, um, but there, you know, even just little things like it, it was so interesting what it was like for me for the first time to just go to church. Um, I, I've done full time ministry all of my adult life. And so the Sunday after I left our church in Charlotte, I found an Episcopal church in our town that I just fell in love with. Uh, we were a very sacramental church. You know, we were very much built around the Eucharist and all that. But to be the person who, instead of serving the Eucharist, was just able to receive the Eucharist. Every week, I would come down and get on my knees there at the front, as we all would do, to receive communion. I would just weep. You know, it, just, it was interesting how much even that moment became something to cling on to. It was like I, the, week were, the weeks were just miserable in between. And, and there would be the sense of, okay, uh, I don't know how much longer I can make it, but I think I can make it till the next Sunday when I'll come back and do this again. And it is these, these little things that would tether me to the ground. Even telling that story about Sweden, I, I, I found that a, you know, a big part of that time for me was um, allowing myself to get to a place where I let other people in my life 
uh, in very uncomfortable ways, uh, get close enough to me to see the needs that I had and, and to lean hard on people in ways that I've just never had to do before. I despise being the one in need. I don't know, in, in my tradition, we actually do, at least in um, historically the tradition, still practice uh, feet washing, foot washing. And I don't know if you've been to foot washing service. Um, I, I'm actually, it's weird, because I'm like, I'm a germaphobe, mildly, in general. But I'm not weird about sacraments. I'm like, you know, it's fine. Oh, you know, God shows up in the water. It's going to be totally cool. So I don't mind washing somebody else's feet. I would wash anybody's feet here and not feel weird about it. No big deal. I hate having somebody wash my own feet. That's the awkward part. My big, hairy, just, I don't know. I, I, I'm, I'm big, so I can't call them hobbit feet. But, you know, they are kind of. Like, I wear a size 14. I think my feet are somehow uniquely disgusting. I can't stand for someone else to wash my feet. I don't feel like there's anybody who's low enough that it would be appropriate for them to wash my feet. Same thing with Peter, right? Uh, when uh, Jesus is washing the feet of the disciples, you know, say, Peter says, like, I, you know, you, no, Lord, you can't do this. And, of course, Jesus very sympathetically says, Oh, Peter, that's fine. If this violates your personal space, it's completely cool. No worries. <laughs> that's not what Jesus says. What Jesus actually <laughs> says is, if you don't let me do this, you have no part with me. And I felt like that was, that, I felt like that so much was what was coming to me in that time, was me saying, no, 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 I can't be served in this way. That's humiliating. And the sense of, no, no, if, if you're going to stay in this at all, um, you're, you're going to have to let this happen. You're going to have to let other people wash your feet. And that's awful. And yet in the same way, I, I think, again, that sense of, having my ego completely stripped, there's so much freedom that comes from that. Oh wow, I am openly, conspicuously a needy person. Um, there, is, there is more to me than preacher, author, blah, blah, blah. I am a regular person that has deep brokenness and needs the help of my friends in order to survive this. Um, th th there's nothing wrong with that. And interestingly enough, I feel like kind of as I'm coming the other side of some of these things, and uh, I feel like the season I'm in right now is, is one where there's a lot of new life. Uh, it, it, it was just six, uh, six months ago that I moved to Tulsa and came on staff at this wonderful church. And I don't know, just like a lot of things that God's rebooting in my life that's really, really good. Still a lot of pain, still a lot of hard stuff to, to be sorted, but just so much that's good. And, and now that I'm finding myself in a place where, you know, you, you, got, you have to share your own story. You can only bear witness to God in the ways that you've encountered Him. The more I share these things vulnerably, it's wild to me just how much that breaks open in other people. I think whereas before people were often reluctant to share certain kinds of pain with me because they thought I wouldn't understand it. They would thought, oh, you know, somebody like you who does all these godly spiritual things and you've always been this sort of person, you know, you just won't get it. Now I feel like it's almost like the fish jump into the boat, you know, like people are just uh, like, they, you, you recognize when you've been through pain, you recognize someone else who's been in, in pain and you recognize when it's safe to share. And so I, I, I described it to, to my friends uh, yesterday, actually, of it's kind of like if you get a new car and you buy a, a, a gray Nissan and all of a sudden it's like you feel like the, the whole, the, like every car is a gray Nissan, like you see them everywhere. And, and before you didn't notice that, right? It's not that there are actually more gray Nissans on the road, it's just now that you have one, you're hyper aware. And that's what it feels like for me now. It's like once having experienced this kind of pain and loss for myself, now I'm much more sensitive to that in other people. And that's something that God, you know, that God uses. So I feel like, it, you know, generally that's, that's, broadly speaking, that's what this book really is about, is this attempt to end sharing some of my own story and sharing some of the things that I feel like God has used to survive my own shipwreck, hoping to kind of throw out a life preserver to somebody else, um, to, to give other folks permission to feel like they can share the tough parts of their story and get those things in light where they can be healed and allow that to be as messy as it needs to be. Um, I, I really don't know what I w would have done in this season of my life without having friends within the church that were safe uh, to really share the, the, the grittiness of all this with, and yet to find myself so so completely loved in the midst of all that, fully seen, fully known in all the places I don't want to be seen and known, and yet to be so completely loved, it, it really is a, an extraordinary thing. So that's a little bit about uh, the book and my life and where I am. This is gonna be something I'm, I can tell I'm gonna have to take some getting used to. It's like, hi, I'm Jonathan, let me disrobe in front of a room full of strangers. Let's just go right, let's just go right into all the hard, awful things and know that at first. Um, so yeah, I think we're going to do some, some Q&A now and chat back and forth a bit. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, round of applause for Jonathan. Huh. Thank you very much. <laughs>